I want to do a series for the next at least two to three weeks. And I want to title the series, uh, I told Deb that we'll title it The Beauty of God's Church. I think I'm going to change it and say The Church in All of Her Beauty will be the title of this series, The Church in All of Her Beauty. The church has taken a lot of hits in recent years. Things are changing rapidly, culturally speaking. And in belief systems, the church is now being accepted in worldly belief systems. But it's a watered-down church. It's not what God intended. And, and I think it's time for us to call the church back to God to really know what is the church, who is the church, what is the church for? What's the purpose of the church? What does God intend in my life through his church? And so I want us to focus on that for the next at least couple, three weeks. We, we've been on this wonderful journey since even before the beginning of this year. It started the Sunday following Christmas. We prepared for the new year with a teaching from John's Gospel where Jesus taught his disciples about what it means to abide in him. John 15, it's the story of us being the branch, Jesus using a parable. We're the branch, or not a parable, but just a, a, a picture. We're the branch. He's, he's the, the vine that we're connected to, and the Father in heaven is the vine dresser. And the vine dresser would come to those branches that were bearing fruit, and he would prune them. He would prune them deeply. It hurt. Pruning is never fun for the plant. Initially, in fact, if you prune too deep, you can shock the plant. I mean, you can shock the plant if you prune it correctly. you got to be careful. There's certain times of the year that you don't prune. But when he sees there's fruit that's coming from a particular branch, and each one of you are a branch, if you are saved, you're in the vine, in Christ. He'll, pr he'll prune you. And, and Why? Because you bore fruit, and he wants you to bear more fruit. Now, that's a different way to approach the new year. What's the, what's the new year's message, Pastor? A positive message. I need to hear it. Uh, God wants to prune you so you'll bear more fruit. And that's what we looked at, and, and, and how God is really after not just, he's not just looking out for us. He's looking out for, ultimately, his kingdom. And we were created so that we might bear fruit for the eternal kingdom of God, not for ourselves. And this is one of the things that breaks the heart of a pastor, is to see the evangelical church as a whole moving in a direction where the messages are now more about giving you more money, give you more promotion in the job place. It's all about you, and that's what they're preaching and there's, that's not in the Bible that way. I'm not saying the Bible doesn't speak about prosperity, but it says, I wish that you would prosper as your soul prospers. As you move closer to God, God will prosper you. But that prosperity might look a whole lot different than money. And, and, and so that was where we started, was let's, let's begin the year knowing that God wants us to bear fruit for the kingdom, but secondly, that if we are bearing some fruit, he's going to prune us this year so that we might bear more fruit. I, he expects me to bear more fruit in 2024 than in 2023. Amen? Then the next week, we focused on returning to the Lord, a message on repentance. What a great way to start the first message of the new year. Repentance! How many churches did that? Uh, repentance in some places is never spoken of because they don't want to scare people away. They're protecting pagans from truth. That's not church. And we're, we, we, we focused on that because repentance is critical to salvation and it's critical to sanctification. Once you're saved as a believer, God still wants you to recognize where you've drifted from him, where you're out of sync with him, and repent. Confess it as sin. Repent of it. Get right with God. This is the right time of the year to start that. Amen? Repent. It's not too late. That's why we're doing a series, that you might get back in alignment with the Lord. Thir nextly, uh, last week at our missions weekend, we heard from two of our global missionaries and their wives 
as they gave us insight into what is happening both in northern India and also uh, specifically in Jerusalem and Gaza. They were just there. Tom and Joanne Doyle have been there since the insurrection or the, the rising of people, uh, Palestinians coming into Israel and the, the atrocities that were committed. And they said there's some we can't even speak of. They're so bad. And, but they took us with slides and showed us the, the houses in Gaza where for weeks after uh, terrorists were still hiding deep into, into the... They said that in Gaza, there is a literal city under the city. The media is not telling us that. The media is not giving us the whole picture. But we had missionaries who were on the ground there. They are telling us some things that we need to know that we might be able to pray. Listen, for Palestinians and Jews, they're both coming to Christ. How wonderful. And they're, they're friends. We saw pictures of Palestinians and Jews with their arms around each other. One Palestinian got saved recently, and he's sending out these daily reports by email or however he's doing it, but maybe of social media encouraging words, and he's sending them to many Jews. And Tom met with him and said, how long have you been in the Lord? Because he thought he knew, and it wasn't very long. And he goes, how are you doing this? And his response was basically, the Lord's doing it. I've been in his word. What are you talking about? Is that not convicting to us? And, and then in northern India, the persecution, as they try to reach Hindus for Christ, tremendous persecution. It, it's interesting, if you follow the life of Gandhi, you'd think that Hinduism is a pacif pacifist type of religion. It's not. I, 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 I literally was in a church service in Kolkata where a man stood there with a scar down his forehead. His wife, they got married. First he came to Christ, went home to his father, who was a butcher. And in India... Whatever trade, whatever class you're in, you can't leave that. That's your future. You can't upgrade. You can't start in one of the lesser classes and work your way up to a Brahmin. You can't do it. you got to stay in that class. And, and because his father was a butcher, he would be a butcher, period. That's it. He came home and he said, Father, I've given my life to Jesus Christ. I no longer have thousands of gods. I have one true God. His father reached over, took the cleaver, whoop, split his head. Then they beat him up in his village. He showed up at Shushantapatra's house in Calcutta because he lived in a little village outside of town. He shows up, and uh, it's been days. He walked all the way. Shushanta said, I opened the door, and he stood there. Everything on him was blood. And the blood had dried up. His clothing was caked and was stuck to his body. We couldn't get the clothes off from the cuts and everything. We had to take him inside, put him in a tub with warm water, and let him soak so we could remove the clothing. He went there to be encouraged, to be supported, to be loved, to be comforted. And that's what they did. Shushanta and his, his wife and and, and other Christians in Kolkata ministered to him. And then about a week later, Shushanta had a conversation with him and said, okay, Sanjoy, now here's what's going to happen. You're going to go back to your village. And the Lord is with you. And you are standing for Christ. And you're going to go back. And they're going to beat you again. But that's Okay. You're making inroads. And the third time that you go back, he said, they, they will begin to listen to your message. And you will see family and villagers come to Jesus. So each time after, he, that's exactly what happened. He got beat. He would come back. And finally, Shushanta, this was months later, knock at the door. He goes to the door, opens the door, and there's like 15 people standing with Sanjo and a big smile, those in his community that received Jesus. That is the life of a true believer. 
I'm not saying that we in North America will be beat up like that. That's not the case. You might lose a job. You might lose some dear friends. But is there any price too great that would keep you from sharing Jesus with people? This is what I want to call us back to in this series on the church. The church needs to get back to being the church that God created. We've drifted away. We also had some wonderful ministries, local outreach ministries that were here last week with their displays, and we support those ministries. You ought to be thankful that you're in a church that supports tremendous global missions and organizations that are solid, that are on their feet or on the ground sharing the gospel. The stories coming are incredible. And then we have local outreach ministries that we support. When you, when you drop something in the box, if it's a tithe, let's say, we, we give out every year a tenth that goes out to global missions and outreach. Every year. And so you're participating in that. But we want to do more than that. This next year, we've already talked with Josh and, and uh, Isaac Shaw of the New Delhi Institute. And Josh is willing to come back with his wife. And they're willing to uh, help us uh, to build teams of people that can go to, go to uh, the mission field in India. Where we can go and serve for a week or, or week, 10 days and serve. Which is exciting. Because once our people start experiencing what New Delhi Institute that we support is experiencing, all of a sudden, the game changes for us. Now it gets into the culture of Vero Bible Fellowship. Now we become more outward focused as a church, and we love people the way God loves people. Amen? That bothers you? Some of you are going, you mean my church is going to change? It's not going to just be about us? Exactly. God forced the early church into that culture. They were all happy in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost. And then persecution kicked up. And God spread them all over the known earth. That was his will. That is the purpose of the church, is to go into all the places, the nook and crannies of this globe, and be part of God's work. Amen? God wants his church to reflect that. And we will reflect it. At some point, we're, you're going to feel the shift of culture here. Not that we ever give up on caring for one another, loving one another. That's deep in our DNA, and it must continue. God does not, he, that also is his will for the church, that the church would be a loving body caring for one another. But it's got to be more than that. There's a balance. How many of you, when you were little, you were on a, t on a, on a seesaw? The teeter-totter. What did you call it? All right. In the church, when a church starts, when I take this off, you are in serious trouble. <laughs> in the early church, when they started the church, oh, I've really messed up. Hang on. What are you doing, Greg? There we go. Hello. Hello. Come on out of there. Demon out. Okay. Now, where is that thing? Forgive me. We are just like the early church. When they first started, the first focus was inward. They were given to the apostles' teaching, breaking bread, fellowship, and prayer. Let's care for one another. When we started Bureau Bible, many people came out of a very difficult situation. There was a lot of woundedness. And so the emphasis was on caring. And, and so here's what the teeter-totter looked like at, at Vero Bible Fellowship when we started. Heavy on care, nothing up here on outreach. And, and to this day, it's like this, somewhere in here. You know what God wants for Vero Bible? Both are vitally important. Can I get an amen? amen. That's where we're going. So let's talk about the church. What is the church? Take your Bible out, if you will, and uh, just be ready to follow along. You probably want to go to Acts chapter 1, but I'm not going to start there. I'm going to start before that. Uh, when we look at the church, Scripture is very clear that the church isn't a thing, and it's not a place. Church is people. 
If we look closely at the word church, we will find its origin in a Greek word. The Greek word is ekklesia, E-K-K-L-E-S-I-A, E-K-K-L-E-S-I-A, ekklesia. That word comes from a root verb, kaleo, or kaleo, K-A-L-E-O, kaleo. That means to call. The church, in essence, is those who have been called, called by God. You cannot belong to God's church any other way. You say, well, I, I, I'm part of the church's motorcycle ministry, and we go out on Saturdays and ride together, and, and uh, so that, that's, my, that's, that's where I fit into the church. Yeah, listen, you're part of a ministry, yes, but you're not in the church because you've got to be called of God. You've got to be saved. God calls us to save us, and if you're not called then you're not in. Now, I don't say that because God is wanting to be mean. It's that he's holy, and he's calling us unto holiness. He's calling us to change, to transform how we live our lives so that we line up with with the word of God. And And then he gives us the Holy Spirit inside of us when we're called in order to help us carry out what we're learning. This is what it means to be in the church. The church is best understood as the called ones. That's that's who we are. We are the fellowship of the called. We're a group called together by God. Vero Bible Fellowship is not a location. You say, yeah, we, we got a property. That's our church. No, that's not our church. That's the building where the church gathers. The people are the church. That'll never change. Don't worry about the building taking precedent over the people. If it does, we're no longer functioning the way God intended the church to function. It's about the people. Okay, now this is interesting. So so we're a group called together by God for his purpose. We are not some human organization, the result of man's ingenuity or man's power. We're not Vero Bible Club. We're not Vero Bible Corps. We're not Vero Bible Recreation Center, Vero Bible Child Care, Vero Bible Counseling Center, Vero Bible Community Center, Vero Bible Convention Center, Vero Bible Performing Arts Center, or even Vero Bible Psychological Center for the uh, maladjusted. <laughs> Some of you are going, oh, yeah, yeah, that's right, because we're all of those things. Wrong! Some of you don't like when I, when I yell, and forgive me when I do, but man, I'm so passionate about some things. This message on the church is, means so much to me. So the next couple of weeks, wear some cotton in your ears uh, if it bothers you. I'm trying to help you because I don't know that I can be necessarily quiet on all this. Listen, the church of Jesus Christ is given for one purpose, and that is to glorify the Father in heaven to be his people, called by his name, loving one another the way God loves us and carrying out his mandate on this earth to share the gospel, to be taught the word of God. We are called to be disciples, not just a church sitter. We're a church server. You were not saved to sit. You were saved to serve him. And so, so this is so important that we understand this. Some of you might be thinking, well, we're... You know, we, 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 we do take care of the, those who are hurting. We do have times of recreation. Yes, but God is the center, not the event. I've seen Christians who get out of whack when a human tradition in that church isn't carried out to the degree that they think it should be. You know why they got whacked? Why they're sideways on it? Because God wasn't where he's supposed to be in their heart. Because when God's where he should be, Human tradition takes a back seat. There are some good human traditions. I want to establish some myself. One would be a Thanksgiving dinner that we feed the community. That's, but that's a human tradition. The Bible doesn't say on Thanksgiving, feed the community. That's just a way of outreach for us. But there could be a day in five years, ten years, if we're doing it, that we say, well, we're going to do something different. Some of you will be like, oh, 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 oh. 
You're taking, yeah, we are. We're going to take it away. We're going to try something else. Why? Because God, by the Holy Spirit, is always moving. And we're not going to just get locked into what man tradition says. Amen. I hope this is resonate, resonating with you. Vero Bible Fellowship only exists because God called us into existence. I want to say this loud and clear. Vero Bible is not Greg's church. I can't tell you how many people have said that to me or had told somebody else, where do you go? I go to Greg's church. God forbid that my name would ever be attached as a head or a leader of the church. This church is the Lord's church. You can say, I go to Vero Bible where Greg is the pastor of the church. That's accurate. But it's not my church. Nobody, want, nobody can compete with God, and this would never be a church if it was my church. It would be an organization of man. So let's get that out of our heads. And, and most of you don't do that, but there could be a, maybe a few people here that still do that. To refer to any church connected to a human being is, is an assault to the name of the one true and living God. The Bible says that he's a jealous God. He doesn't share his glory with anybody. Churches are known for putting people's names on the church building. They, they want to they recognize this person, this is the such and such building. This is the, and every pew, remember growing up in the, pew, in the churches and the pew chairs, and at the end you had a label on the end of the pew chair, and it had in memory of and the name of the family, or in honor of, they're still living, but when mem- they, they paid for that pew. That's how they paid for the pew chairs. People would get a little tag on the end. Now think about this, and I don't mean, some of you probably did that, so... Uh, I, I grew up in the church like that, never had a problem with it until I thought through it. When I thought about God's intent for the church, I had a problem. Here's the problem. So you gave money for the chair because your name would be on it? Or you gave to the work of God and they were able to purchase pew chairs? You see the difference? You've got to be careful never to let man rise. Only God rises here. I'm going to say this to you, church, and I I haven't even opened the scripture yet. I mean, I've got so much. We're not going to get there. It's okay. That's why it's a two to three week. This is like an intro. Okay. Um, Whenever, please, please understand this. Whenever something good happens in the life of Vero Bible Fellowship, God gets all the glory, not some. We don't include him. He gets all the glory. Whenever something bad happens, and I mean anything bad happens, man probably got in the way of God, except when God brought that to us for a reason. So if it's good, God gets the glory. If it's bad, blame man for interfering in the Lord's work. Or God's about to deal with us and bring judgment to us if necessary. So that's very important that we understand. That's how serious I take the church. Listen, I love the church. The church has been my life from the time I came into this world. I was not saved when I came in this world, so I was not a member of the church, but I was at church. Why? I wouldn't exist if it were not for the church. You say, that's weird. Well, my parents both grew up in churches, and then they both went to a Christian college where they met If Christ had not transformed them and their church sent them to a Christian college, pointed them and directed them in that direction, I wouldn't be here. That's what I mean by that. God is the one that creates, right? But it's amazing the impact that church should have on us. Both my parents were raised there. They went to Christian college, all of that. When my dad met my mom at college, he was pretty impressed. Some guy was with her, and he went up and said, hey, can I take you home? And the guy was a little bit tiffed because he wanted to take her home, uh, take to her house. 
So then my dad starts dating my mom, and somebody said to him, uh, I think it was one of her uh, cousins, said, uh, yeah, Lou is the best stripper in town. And my dad, what? I'm dating a stripper? She worked at a company that stripped magazines. <laughs> when my parents married, they set up house in Daytona Beach and belonged to a local church. And when I say belong, I mean that they were saved and that was the church that God called them to. They were committed to the church. I grew up as a boy watching two people committed to the church. To belong to the church is to belong to Christ. Therefore, you make his, his church the first priority of your life. Why? Because that is God's plan for every believer. It's not just to have Christ. Let me tell you what's done great harm to the church and to God's work. And by the way, the church was not established by man. It was established by God. We're going to look at that. But here's what does great harm, irreparable harm in some situations, is that this whole concept of personal relationship with Jesus. Show me in the Bible where it says that God's calling me to a personal relationship with Jesus. Now, don't, don't get out ahead of me. He is calling you into a relationship with Jesus. And it is personal. He knows you by name. But not at the expense of belonging to the church. Nowadays, people have a personal... I have a personal relationship with Jesus as if that's all I need. I don't need the church because I have a personal relationship with Jesus. You don't understand what God intended with church. You're not understanding scripture. I grew up inside a fellowship of believers. I was saved and baptized in that fellowship. I learned about God in that fellowship. Later in my early 20s, I received a call of God to pastor one of his local churches. Later, I would meet my wife in the church, and we began our life together following the call of God. We moved to Palm Beach Gardens where God called us to, to be part of a, a pastoral team. Church is where we raised our four children. It's where we they, where they received their understanding of Scripture and who God is and what God expects of us. That's where they were able to be baptized, saved and baptized. They grow up. They meet Christian spouses. Now all four of our kids are in churches. and well, Three of them are here, and one of them is out in Chicago in a church. And, and their children are now being taught the importance of church. This is my life. Everything good that has happened in my life, I can look back and I can say part of it is, obviously all of it's God, but part of it is specifically directed at the church. The good that has come to me through the church. There's nothing I would rather be than a pastor of one of his churches. That's why it's important that I give God the first fruits of my life. Not because I'm a pastor, because I'm a member of his church. I give him the first fruits of my spiritual gifts. I give him the first fruits of my resources. I give God the first, first of everything. I have committed my life belonging, serving, and protecting God's church. There's nothing I would rather do than shepherd a flock of God. I hope to do that my whole life. I don't have any desire to retire I don't want to sit on a golf course somewhere and count the dandelions in the backyard. I don't take joy in spending half or more than half of a day swinging a golf club. I love fellowship on the golf course, so if you want to go play golf, I'd love to get with you. And well, I'll swing the club a little bit, but that's not what I'm about. I love the church and moving the church's causes forward. Why? Because this church belongs to God, and God has a plan for his church. So let me take you through a couple scriptures here. How are we doing on time? I don't even have a clue. That's dangerous for a preacher not to know what time it is. Okay. Man, I got a lot of time. Okay. Let me wet the whistle here. The last thing I want to do is spit on the people in the front pew. Tosh is new to the church. I'd never want to do that to her. Okay. So let's look at some scripture. 
My hope is that you will return to God's church. If you're here visiting and you've not been part of a church, I pray that God would speak to your heart by the Holy Spirit. If you're here and you do come to church, I pray that God would strengthen and shore up that commitment of relationship to his church. Um, why did God create the church? The church was given by God as a restraint against sin, first and foremost. It's one of the ways that God holds back all out hell breaking free on this earth. The church is a restraint against sin. The Holy Spirit uses it. That's why God instituted, one of the reasons he instituted the church was to hold back sin. Now, there's coming a day when God's going to pull back, and, and you're going to see, I mean, it's already, it seems like all hell's breaking loose in this world, but there's still a church, and the church still has a role. Up to the time when Jesus returns, the church will be here and have a role carried out by the Father through us. Are you part of it? God wants you to be part of it. Matthew chapter 18, verse 15. Let me read for you. Matthew 18, 15. Turn there, if you will, please. I'll give you a second. Go ahead. Matthew 18, 15. It says, if your brother, this is Jesus speaking, by the way, teaching, teaching disciples. He says, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. Sin is always working on us. The temptation to sin is great. And every day that we live, we are tempted and Oftentimes, we fail the test, and we fall into sin. Maybe it's a thought. Maybe it's a judgment that we give, a condemnation towards somebody. Those are sins when you condemn someone. Condemning means there's no hope for them. Um, as long as there's a God, there's hope. You have no right to condemn anybody. And so here he's saying, in your relationship with one another, listen, look, look what he said. He said, Listen to you. You have gained your who? Brother. What did he say at first? If your brother sins. So he's talking about people in the church. How many of you know people get whacked out in church? I feel sorry for people who did not have the upbringing I had to grow up in the church and understand. And many of you did not. You've come to the church later in your life. And thank God for you because you bring a freshness. You have a reality of what it's like out there that I didn't have. I was always in the church. But some of you are saying, yeah, because you don't obviously know what I went through when I was in the church. It was not a good experience like you're talking about. Uh, you're saying that I didn't have bad experiences in the church? I'm sorry, that's not true. Oh, I had some bad experiences too. I had many times where man got in the way of God's work, and it hurt, and it hurt deeply. But that's, I'm not going to blame God for that. That's man. And here he says, in the church, you're going you're gonna to have issues with each other. There's going to be some sins that are committed against each other. And so he says, here's how you handle it. You go to the person. Why? Because God wants you to work it out. That's your brother. How many of you, okay, we all have a, you know, a cousin, Eddie, that we just would rather not spend much time with. And then when they show up, you know, okay, how long is he, going to, is he going to be here? And we endure cousin Eddie. We all have those. Um, but guess what? You don't disown Eddie. He's still in the family. In the church, it's even more powerful than that. Even people who are so different than you that you would never feel like you want to hang out with, but God, by the Holy Spirit, transforms all of you. And now, all of a sudden, you're one body with one baptism, one spirit, joined together in unity. And this is what this is about. He's calling them back. You look what he says. He goes further. He says, if he does not listen to you, take two or three along with you. Witnesses, that every charge may be established by evidence of two or three witnesses. You can't make an accusation if it's just you. 
You've got to bring somebody who also sees that in them, okay? Then, if he refuses to listen to the witnesses, then, look, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, and here we would say that's elders, you would bring it to the elders. And if they don't listen to the elders, then let that person be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Treat them like a pagan. He, he's establishing church discipline here. Why? As a restraint so sin doesn't come into the church and take over the church. The church of Jesus Christ is not to be made up of a bunch of people who are still living in sin. Yes, every one of us falls daily to sin. But the pattern of our life is to follow God in holiness. That's our goal. And the church is set up by God for a way that you can be held accountable and supported so that you don't go, with, go out and live like the devil. That's good stuff. That's what he's established. Then the church is called to be pure and holy. This is the opposite of the world. Acts chapter 5, turn there, Acts 5 verse 10. This is the story of Ananias and Sapphira. At that period of time in the early church in Jerusalem, the, the, those who had been saved were taking properties that they owned and selling the properties and bringing the money and giving the money to uh, the apostles. They were laying the money at the apostles' feet so that the church would have money to feed the poor and all of the things that the church was about. Take care of the pastor. All those things were part of it. And so Ananias and Sapphira, they said to the Holy Spirit that we're going to sell this property and we're going to give the money to the church. Well, they sold the property. And guess what they didn't do? They didn't give all the money to the church. They gave a little bit, but they kept money out of that cell for themselves. Now, had they said, we're going to give a portion of this money to the church, that would have been fine. That's not what they said, though. They gave, they said, we're going to give this to the church. So they show up to church on Sunday. Ananias walks in. Sapphira is not at church yet. She's still home putting her hairdo together. And, and he shows up and goes before and probably lays down a little bit of money. And the apostle, by the Holy Spirit, says to him, uh, is, I thought you were going to give the whole amount. Oh, well... Um, and immediately, listen now, he was struck dead by God. The ushers became pallbearers, and they carried him out. Sapphira finally shows up. She's ready. She's got her, she's all dolled up looking good, comes in the church. They confront her. Were you not supposed to give all of that to the church? She falls over dead. How's that for a church service? God's taken them out, man, because they lied. Would any of us be here right now? I mean, if, if you've not said something and, or if you said something and didn't follow through on it, uh, that's probably pretty much all of us at some point on something. Right now, the Holy Spirit could just, we all go out. They show up, you know, for school Monday morning, and they're like, there's a bunch of dead people in here. What's going on? Thank God for grace. Amen. But, you, but I want you to see this. Acts 5, verse 10. Immediately she fell down at his feet and breathed her last. And when the young men came in, they found her dead, and they carried her out and buried her beside her husband. And great fear came upon the whole church, I guess, and upon all who heard of these things. Not just the church, but even the pagan community heard what happened. This is a restraint. God's saying, don't play games in my church. If you're saved, you're called by God, and God expects all of us to be part of his church, to share the love of Christ, to care about one another. And when we get skewed, when we get sideways with somebody over something, we work it out. That's the way God designed his church to function. By the way, the fact that the church is not made up of perfect people, but people like you, is reason why you grow spiritually. You got to work through a lot of stuff if you belong to a church because it's not perfect. 
And you've heard that, you know, well, I'm going to go somewhere else because I'm going to find a perfect church. Well, if you show up, it's not perfect anymore. <laughs> That's, we're going to get messed up. We're going to get skewed. We're going to get our, we're going to get sideways. It's okay. We restore each other. We love each other. We forgive each other. We stay with the family of God. Why? Because God called me to this family. I belong to his church. By God's design, the true church of God faces persecution in this world. That's another element here I want to look at real quick. In Acts chapter 8, we know Saul approved of Stephen's execution. It says in verse 1, And there arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem. See, up to that point in time, from Acts chapter 2 to Acts chapter 8, um, the church was doing great. People were getting saved daily. Pretty cool. And then all of a sudden, there's a first martyr. Simply because he stood on the work of Christ on the cross, and he believed in the resurrection of Jesus, and that the same resurrection power could transform us in our way of living, and we can belong to Christ. And they threw stones and killed him. It says right here, and there arose that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea, Judea Samaria, except the apostles. Devout men buried Stephen and made great lamentation over him. But Saul, young Paul, when he was known by his Jewish name, Saul, he was ravaging the church. He entered house after house. Why? Because the early church both met in the public setting by the temple at Solomon's Colonnade and other places, and they met also in homes. And he goes from house to house, dragging off men and women, and he committed them to prison. In other places, we find Paul also approved of their death. In 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12, it says, Beloved, do not be surprised by the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you, but rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings. He's talking about persecution. And that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. He, he, he's, he's saying, hey, when, when, when somebody speaks ill of you because you're a believer, because you stood up, they started mocking you, laughing at you. They've broken fellowship with you because of your Christian belief system. You lost your job because you're a believer. Hey, hey listen, he's saying, rejoice! Because you can now relate to the suffering of Jesus. Oh, what a privilege to suffer as our Lord suffered. Is that the church at Bureau Bible Fellowship? Would we fit that? I hope so. And I hope through this series, more and more of us, by the Holy Spirit, by the truth of God's word, would come to see what really is being, I'm being called to. I was called by God to salvation and to his works. But I'm also called to belong to his church. Let me tell you what was going on. Here's one. Acts chapter 12, verse 1. About that time, Herod the king laid violent hands on some who belonged to the church. The church was being persecuted. Not just members, not just people, but the church. Who belongs to that church? Let's go get them. Let's round them up. We know that's true today. In North Korea, they would round up. They'd find a house church. they round them all up. I was in, in Bhutan, is what they call it up in northern India. Went into Bhutan. And, and at night, we snuck in and went straight to a little uh, house, a little uh, straw hut, and went straight in. And there was a fire, and there was a woman, probably in her 20s, with a little child. And we came in, and she had head covering on, and she spoke in her language, and it was interpreted. She said, we must pray. And we gathered, circled up, little group, five, six guys, and she led us in prayer. We prayed together in Bhutan, and then we had to leave immediately, get out and get across the border. She lived right on the border, but she was in Bhutan. 
Because in Bhutan, it's 100% Buddhist. And if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, you disappear. I didn't say that you're killed. Maybe, I don't know. But you're hauled off somewhere. But you're not part of the community of that nation. You're not accepted as a believer. That's a church meeting in Bhutan right now. There are places all over the globe, churches are risking their lives for the sake of the gospel every time they meet. This moves my heart. And and so what comes with persecution in the church? What's the role of the church? Prayer. (laughs) Look at it. Acts chapter 1, verse 14. All these with one accord were devoting themselves to prayer together with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers. The whole group was 120 that gathered in the upper room, and they were praying for 10 days, waiting for the Holy Spirit to come. They didn't know how long it would take, so they didn't know the end time of the prayer. They just kept meeting every day and praying. And finally, the Holy Spirit shows up on the day of Pentecost. And Jesus said that would happen, Acts 1-8, but you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. Acts chapter 12, verse 5, so Peter was kept in prison. Why? Because he was sharing the gospel. He was, uh, God was using him mightily, and it was stirring up the Jewish council. They were upset. They had him thrown in prison. And it says, so Peter was kept in prison, but earnest prayer, earnest prayer for him was being made to God by the church. wonder what that looked like. What did earnest prayer of a church look like as Peter was in prison. I think God wants us to pray earnestly for our missionaries that are putting their lives at risk for the gospel. I think God wants us to pray for each other that as we say to the fellowship, I want to be a witness every day. I I don't know what the cost will be, but I'm not going to back off. I'm going to be loving. I'm going to be kind. I'm not going to be obnoxious, belligerent, but I'll be loving and kind but I am going to stand for truth. You need earnest prayer for that because you will be attacked. You will come under persecution. Friends, this is what the church is about. This is what our children should grow up in this church and see. They should see adults, moms and dads, and, and members of this fellowship risking their lives for the sake of the gospel. That's what I want my grandchildren in this church to see. I want them to see the, church, the real church. I don't want them to see a church that's joined with the evangelical community and has accepted the culture of this day where it's just easy to go to church and it's a cushioned chair and it's just everything. There's no harm. There's no, it's a safe place. It's, it's not just about us. The church was created for the glory of God and for his end result on the earth. And God has called us to be that, to do that. And it will cost us something to do it. To follow Christ, it will cost you. It's free to be saved. I mean, God does the work, right, through Christ on the cross. But but to be a Christian, it will cost you. If we don't prepare our kids now, our grandchildren now, our children, they will not be prepared for what is coming in this world in the next few decades. I'm telling you, whatever we're experiencing right now in this culture, it will be much worse. And if all we give them is a cute little pretty warm fuzzy picture of the church where I go, I hear some little sermonette to Christianettes and uh, he tells cute stories and I leave feeling encouraged. Uh, When are you going to feel convicted? When are you going to feel challenged? When are you going to feel encouraged and strengthened by the word of God? That's what the church is to provide to God's people. Amen? Church is made up of very different people, yet all of us are one in Christ. You know what my greatest heart's desire is right now for the life of Vero Bible Fellowship? Is that we would reflect the people that live in this community. All the people. Every, every tribe, every nation, every tongue. 
would be represented in Vero. If there's people in Vero Beach that are not like us, I hope that we are able to reach some for Christ. I hope that we are a warm and loving place that will receive people regardless of color, nationality, cultural background. I don't care, socioeconomic, whatever. I, I hope that we would be a church that would love everybody. And that when we go out each day and share Christ, we don't pick and choose who to share with. One of the memories I have as I say that, I just didn't think about it until just now. When I was pastoring in Palm Beach Gardens, every, every Thursday, the garbage truck would come by on the Holly Drive there and pick up the cans, dump them, and keep moving. And these guys, but I noticed these guys, when the truck would stop, there were three of them, two on the back, one inside. They would stop. They, the, the driver would jump out, run back to the back. These three guys would huddle up right there in front of the church and pray a prayer. And then they'd get back in and take off. And the whole thing t- took maybe a minute and a half, two minutes. Because they had a route to run. They were working, but they would stop and pray. I thought, my goodness, that is awesome. So I was there Thursday waiting, waiting, waiting. They finally showed up. The guy jumps out. I go running down. (laughs) Can I join you? Yes. We prayed together. You know what my prayer was when I got back? Father, those are the guys I want in my church. They're real. They take being a Christian seriously. Yet sometimes the church shuns people that are not like them. And I close with this, but in Ephesians 4, 6, there is one body, one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. Did God leave anybody out? So why are we leaving people out? Why are we being so selective in who we speak with? Acts chapter 13, verse 1. Now there were in the church at Antioch prophets and teachers, Barnabas, and Simeon, Barnabas Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manan, a lifelong friend of Herod, the Tetrarch, and Saul. These were the leaders of the church in Antioch. Interestingly, the Holy Spirit, as they were worshiping God and praying, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. What work was that? To be missionaries. Missionaries come out of the church. Missionary organizations should not function on their own. They are directly connected to the church. And in this case, the missionaries came out of the church in Antioch. He said, I want you guys to set these guys apart and send them. So now let's look at who these men were that were leading the church in Antioch. Antioch, by the way, was in Syria. That's up north, above Jerusalem, okay? Northwest of Jerusalem. Barnabas was a member of the priestly tribe of Levi. Simeon, who was called Niger, likely a black man. He was certainly dark-skinned. Lucius of Cyrene, he was likely a Jew who settled in Cyrene from Libya. He might have been a man of color. After Stephen was martyred, some Jews went to Syria and the gospel was shared and the church was established. That's why why these men came to Antioch. And then Manan, he was raised raised with Herod. (laughs) Two completely outcomes. One took the head of John the Baptist The other, raised in the same home, shares the gospel with the world, sends out missionaries. This is the beauty of the church. This is what the gospel of Jesus Christ can do, that we don't see color, we don't see difference in people. We love everybody the same, everybody. I was telling Keith Happy this morning, I don't know what's going on with my eyes, but I just got this prescription maybe six months ago, and I could see far, and I could read up close. Now, I'm a little blurred when I read up close, and, and I can't see any of you. You're blurred. When I take my glasses off, I can see every one of you. So I don't know what the Lord's doing. 
but I got to get with the program because I don't like looking out and not being able to recognize it. If you came today and, I, and you looked right at me and gave me a smile and I looked right at you and didn't even see you, you thought, that is one cruel pastor. No, I just don't see you. And you know what? I wish all of us were like that, that we didn't see and measure people, that we would just see people called by God, one body, one baptism, one spirit, all unified for the cause of Christ. Amen? Father, I want to thank you for this morning, and I want to thank you for this time. We're going to enter into a time as we step outside where we baptize people into the body of Christ a public demonstration that they have received the call of God. They have surrendered to Christ, and now they are making a public profession of their faith in Christ. The, the, the dipping of a person underwater is not what saves them. It is not somehow changed them. It's, there's no magical formula here. It's a picture. Therefore, if any man be in Christ or woman, he is a new creature. Old things, all things pass away. Behold, all things become new. As we're lowered under the water, we're recognizing that I have died to self. And as I come up out of the water, I'm made alive in Christ Jesus. That's already happened at my salvation, but it's a picture that I want people to know this is what's happened to me. I am a true follower of Jesus. He has called me and saved me. Thank you, Father, for that. I pray that today, Lord, as the prayer partners come and elders to stand for a moment, if you'd like to come and pray, maybe because you want to recommit your life to Christ, this is the day. Do it. Do it. Father, call them. Draw them. Let them experience what it means to truly belong to your beautiful church. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.